Sometimes it's not the players that make a team a winner. Sometimes it's the system put in place for those players to run that make the difference between winning and losing. 2013, two years ago, TCU found that out the hard way by winning only four games that year in an offense that really was not fit for quarterback Trevon Boykin that didn't allow him to really reach his full potential. In other words, he pretty much looked like Karina Dogchild that year. But then he looked like a beautifully baked souffle the following year as the spread offense and the implementation of both Sonny Cumby as well as Doug Meacham allowed this offense to be free, to run the spread. And TCU made a dramatic turnaround from 4-8 and eight two years ago to a 12-1 record co-Big 12 championship and a major bowl win, Peach Bowl, as they absolutely kicked Ole Miss all over the Georgia Dome field. Entering this season, expectations are high because the offense returns nearly everybody for a team that, again, last year came so close to the college football playoff. And the way they played against Ole Miss, they look like they perhaps deserved a spot. But that loss to Baylor really did TCU in, in a conference that, again, doesn't have a conference championship game. And that didn't help TCU's cause either. Entering this season, Trevon Boykin, you know, you have him back. He is the headliner for this team, a Heisman Trophy candidate. You know, he threw for nearly 4,000 yards in 2014, 33 TDs, only 10 interceptions. And, of course, you know, before the spread offense was implemented last year, we knew uh, Boykin, you know, his, his strength, and we thought his only strength at the time was running the ball. Well, we found out that with the spread system, he could definitely be more of an impact player, but he still shows that last year he can run with it. He ran for over 700 yards a year ago. So a great multidimensional quarterback in Trevon Boykin, great athlete entering his senior year. Same thing with um, Aaron Green, who came on strong midway and, you know, into the season with a bullet over 900 yards rushing. And by the way, 7.1 yards per carry. Extremely fast in the open field. Aaron Green's one to watch for once again this year for the Horn Frogs. And of course, if you're looking for terrific receivers, I don't know if any other college football team goes as deep as the guys in Fort Worth do. Six of the top seven receivers return for the Horn Frogs, including Josh Doxson, could be an All-American this year, well over 1,000 yards in receiving a year ago in 66 grabs. Complimenting him, a guy that had almost 800 yards in receiving in Colby Lizenby, and both of those guys are seniors. The other two in the spread attack that will be a part of the receiving unit for uh, TCU, uh, you know, Deontay Gray, guy last year, 36 catches, over 500 yards receiving. And rounding out the lineup, a guy with a lot of experience as well, 32 catches and over 300 yards uh, for the fourth guy in that lineup. That's Ty Selena. So with Selena, with Gray, with Elizabeth, with Doxon, you've got so many options that um, Boykin will have to throw to. And he'll have fine protection because of a mostly senior-led offensive line that returns nearly everybody, including Joey Hunt at center. And um, also, too, uh, don't forget about um, Halo Poti Baitai um, at the left tackle spot and at left guard Jamil Neff. And then rounding out this lineup, uh, one of the new faces and the only non-senior on this uh, TCU offensive side, um, looks like you'll have Joseph Noteboom at right tackle. Um, Again, the only non-senior amongst the offensive linemen and rounding it out, right guard, got experience in, um, in uh, Brady Fultz. A couple of those players last year on the offensive line for TCU were second team all Big 12. The Horn Frogs, how dramatic was their change as far as offense goes? You don't think the spread didn't make a difference? In 2013, that 4-8 team, they scored 301 points that year. 301. Last year, TCU scored 604, more than doubling their total, second highest scoring offense in college football, 46 and a half points per game. And again, you get nearly everybody back. So we can put them on the same level with Ohio State, right? And put TCU in the championship game, right? We haven't talked about the defense yet. And it's not that the defense was, was horrible last season. In fact, if you look at the stats, you know, quite the contrary. I mean, 18th overall in defense, but the big problem is going to be the back seven. You lose almost all of them from a productive D from a year ago. But we'll talk about the good first of all. That's the front four, which has plenty of experience, even though uh, you won't have the services of Chucky Hunter, who is so valuable as a defensive lineman. But you do return James McFarland um, at defensive end his senior year now, and this guy was absolutely everywhere on the field. Seven sacks, which led the team. And by the way, the defensive line of their 30 sacks in production, 27 of those productive sacks return. Again, you lose Chucky Hunter, but you do return McFarlane, um, an extremely impactful player at 6'3", 248. 
Also, um, returning into the mix for TCU, um, you're going to have some other experience as well to mention. And we talk about defensive plays. How about Chris Bradley? You'll have him at defensive tackle, 12 stops a year ago. And Davey and Pearson, all Big 12 honorable mention, 33 stops for the Horn Frogs. Him and uh, Josh Carraway, who'll occupy uh, the other spot defensive end, um, had 33 stops as well. And you, you have a solid lineup, in my opinion, at defensive end because you can go with Terrell Lathan and also uh, Mike uh, Tawana. TCU last year had a very, very good rotation. That's why their defensive line did not do too bad against the run. Remember, they play a 4-2-5 alignment, which isn't exactly run-friendly, but in terms of stopping the pass, it's, you know, that's, that's its main thing, okay, because you have the extra defensive back out there. But, you know, 4-2-5 last year actually worked fine in you know, both regards. Now, for the not-so-good news for TCU. Top three linebackers have all departed, okay? And it really, it's a stinker when you lose guys like, you know, Marcus Mallett, as well as Paul Dawson, the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, not to mention uh, Jonathan Anderson as well. Um, over 200 combined tackles, by the way, uh, for those guys, that production is now erased. So entering this season, um, you know, who do you rely on, okay? Who do you rely on? Well, 425 alignment, uh, one guy that saw some action was Sammy Douglas, 17 tackles a year ago. The other linebacker spot, keep an eye on this because it looks like they're going to go with a true freshman in Mike Freeze. No kidding, Mike Freeze. And backing him up, by the way, another freshman um, who just um, moved to the Fort Worth area, that's Alec uh, Dunham. So this is going to be a young TCU defense. And if you think they're young at the linebackers, um, they have some bodies to replace, too, in terms of the secondary because of the production you got from Chris Hackett, you know, who played the weak safety, Kevin White, and, of course, you know, All-American Sam Carter and his four interceptions. Um, by the way, Hackett was responsible for seven picks a year ago for the Horn Frogs, so 13 interceptions from that defensive unit, from those three guys alone, that has to be replaced. So what do you do if you're TCU? Well, remember, um, you know, one of their co-defensive coordinators now after uh, the retirement of uh, Dick Bumpkiss was uh, Chad Glasgow. You know, Chad Glasgow, um, a guy that I actually went to high school with at Woodward, believe it or not. You know, I was a teammate of his for one year, my senior year and his junior year, just to tell you, you know, how ancient I am. <laughs> um, you know, Glasgow was a defensive backs coach or the safeties coach for TCU when they won the Rose Bowl against Wisconsin a few years ago and was a defensive coordinator for Texas Tech. Now he's back in Fort Worth, and he'll be the co-defensive coordinator, and he'll coach uh, the defensive backs as well. And the guy that will also share that role with him will be uh, Demontre Cross, who was the linebackers coach. Well, you can now add co-defensive coordinator to his name as well. So you got a feeling there's going to be a ton more emphasis on on this young secondary than ever. And it will help that you have a little bit, you know, of experience back um, in, in that regard as well um, from at least one guy for TCU. And if you look at their defensive players, um, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, Derek Kindred, you know, 71 stops a year ago, also four picks from the free safety spot. Also, too, just a sophomore, uh, Terrence Mosley, and that's at one corner, the other corner, uh, Re'Anthony Tejada. Uh, strong safety, uh, just a sophomore, that's Denzel Johnson. Wrapping up the TCU lineup, uh, Kenny um, Iloka, uh, one of the few seniors on this squad for uh, TCU. So as you can tell, offensively, they're loaded. A lot of seniors, but defensively, because they lost the majority of starters, especially in the back seven, there is some retooling to do. And against Big 12 opponents like Baylor, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, who are extremely pass-happy, and don't forget West Virginia as well, um, big challenges await Fort Worth for TCU's defense. And the place kicker, he returns for TCU. That's Jaden Obercrom, and the guy last year made nearly 90% of his kicks. And returning Ethan Perry, punter, so you got experience there, nearly 40 yards per boot for him. Schedule for TCU, first game, by the way, is tonight against the Minnesota Golden Gophers as I'm broadcasting this on September the 3rd. Unfortunately, TCU is going to be without two defensive starters. Gary Patterson hasn't said who and won't say who. He said you'll know by kickoff. Well, if you look at the depth chart for TCU, James McFarland as well as Raymond, um, as well as Deshaun Raymond, neither players on the current depth chart. So maybe that leads you to believe it's those two guys, but it's going to be two defensive starters that won't play tonight. And remember, you know, Minnesota uh, last season got to a bowl game, and they got to a bowl game with these. I think they won nine games a year ago. 
So that game at Minnesota to open the season could get a little bit tricky, but you would think TCU offensively will have enough in this game. And then if you look at the rest of the schedule, uh, Texas Tech on the road to begin Big 12 play last season. Uh, TCU looked like they were going to score 100 in that matchup at Fort Worth. They ended up settling for over 80, though. Texas, boy, you got to be ready for them because the Longhorns, you know that defense is going to be ready. Um, but you get home field advantage against the Longhorns playing at Fort Worth on the third. And then back-to-back -back road games against Kansas State and Iowa State. That K-State game could be a little bit on the tricky side, so Horn Frogs have to watch out there. Remember TCU a year ago? You know, they had four Big 12 road games. Texas wasn't a problem. However, Baylor was. That was, you know, TCU's only loss of the year. And West Virginia and Kansas could have been disastrous. You know, West Virginia, one-point win, and Kansas was winning the majority of that game, um, and Kansas was the worst team in the Big 12, as they usually are, and yet they gave TCU all they wanted. So road play, something to really keep an eye on for the 2015 Horn Frogs. And then rounding out the schedule, it looks like those last three games, um, not the last three, but three of the last four in November, are going to be amongst the biggest challenges. You know, TCU never plays well in Stillwater, so November 7th will be a challenge. Two weeks later, they have to go to Norman to face the Sooners, and... Six days later, the day after Thanksgiving, Baylor comes to Fort Worth in what will be one of the most anticipated matchups of the year. Baylor and TCU, both terrific offensively, but Baylor has a lot more back on the defensive side. I look for TCU again. I look for their offense to be just as good, if not better. Boykin is certainly something special. And don't forget about the running back, Aaron Green, as well, and an experienced offensive line that should be able to roll over teams like bowling pins. Defensively, though, there's a lot of concerns because you lose so many of your top productive players, both coverage-wise and tackle-wise. I still think TCU is a double-digit winning team. I still think they're going to finish high in the Big 12. Even though I know they have home field advantage against Baylor, I'm going to say that TCU finishes second. Baylor has more experience back on the defensive side, and I think that will make the ultimate difference. But for TCU, I look for 11-1 and one with Baylor being their only loss at the end of the year. And I think TCU will get a major bowl bid, one of those, um, you know, one of those New Year's Six bowl games on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. So TCU will still have another solid year. But remember, most of their quality this season are seniors. So the Horned Fox got to make a count now. Thanks for watching.